Hey guys, we're here in chapter three in LPAP Kogo. And so I want to know, um, who am I? We ask ourselves that question all the time, and it's really a two-part question, okay? Who am I as an individual, and who am I, uh, who are we as a group, okay? In most languages, besides contemporary English, there is a distinction between um, the singular you and the plural you, okay? So who are you as an individual is a different question than who are you as a group. So who am I and who are we? Think about what constitutes the group of people who uh, are fundamentally like you, okay? What qualities do they possess in common? And so that's what I want you to start thinking about, that identity. Who are you? Who are you as a person? Who are you as a group of people? What groups do you feel like you belong to? So start thinking about that as we start talking about this unit, and we're going to start talking about ethnic and national identities. And so I want you to th start thinking about where do you fall in? Um, in both of these lines, okay? So let's go ahead and get started today. So let me ask you this. Which do you identify with the most? Your sex, gender, your race or ethnicity, uh, your religion, your state or your region of your country, or your actual country? Which one of those do you uh, identify with um, the most your your gender your your ethnicity your religion your state or your country Okay, if you're like most people um, You should be complaining right now about having to choose just one characteristic about your identity with this is where you identify Okay, social identities depend on context and that's going to vary Okay, think about different situations in which one of your identities such as yours your gender or your uh, might be more relevant uh, to how you think of yourselves um, than others, such as um, being a student, okay? So for me, um, when I travel a little bit, okay, um, depending on where I'm at, I'm probably going to have a different answer about my identity, okay? Uh, some people might say, um, where are you from when I go to visit Nevada? And I'll say, you know, I'm from um, Chicago area, or I'll say I'm from Illinois. Um, now, if I am traveling to, say, Bloomington Normal, and somebody says, where are you from? I'm going to say LaSalle, Peru area, okay? I'm not going to use it. I'm going to give a kind of a reference of where do I kind of associate with, okay? And so that's going to be very different. Um, and so who am I as a person? Who am I as a, who do I identify with as a group? These are going to be very important things. And so they're going to vary based on the context that we're talking about, okay? So identity is not just one single thing, and that's the point that we want to make sure that we get here. So let's go ahead and start with ethnic identity. Ethnic identity is defined as the, spe the specific attributes or societal institutions that make one group of people culturally different than, an than another, okay? So some examples might be race in the United States, okay? Black and white. Um, or cultural communities in East Africa or religion in India, how do members know who is in this group and who is out of this group? Consider whether ethnicity is a biological category or whether it is something else, okay? Uh, are you born into this group? So for example, in the United States, whether it is um, uh, people often affiliate people as black or white with their skin color, uh, but what happens if somebody's skin color is kind of ambiguous? Okay, uh, there is a long history of light-skinned people with at least some African American origin um, passing as white. Um, how, for instance, do do they fit into a a, um, a specific uh, group in the United States? Um, and so we look to other things. Maybe you identify with other people around you through through language. Uh, you speak English, or you speak. Um, uh, Spanish or you speak French or you speak Russian okay maybe that's how you identify with a group maybe it's through your music maybe it's through your clothing how do you identify with a group so your ethnicity um, often is going to be kind of tied to your birth uh, but then you're also going to kind of branch out into these cultural traditions from that group of people that you identify with now national identity is defined as a sense of belonging to a nation and a belief in its political aspirations. So a nation, we should remember, is a group that desires self-government.
government, okay? National identity is inherently political. Uh, often is, but not always, but often is derived from ethnic uh, identity and the basis for nationalism is pride in one's uh, people and belief that they're, they have a unique political destiny, that they are the ones that they're very proud of, of that, okay? We are still in the realm of aspirations here. So for the moment, um, we will leave aside any p practical political realities, okay? And in some cases, we have the idea that one of the groups we belong to is the one that is appropriate for us to be governed by, okay? The, the people within the group that share the idea that is, it is okay um, for, for them to be subject to a common set of rules or, uh, on that identity. So if we are Americans or, or, or maybe Canadians or, or whatever, um, we think it is appropriate for us to be subject to, the sim to similar rules. Okay, that all Americans are subject to these rules and therefore as an American I should be subject to these rules or all Canadians are subject to these rules and therefore uh, as a Canadian I should be subject to these rules. Okay, we would think that it's strange however or, or even inappropriate uh, for an outsider to come in and start dictating the rules to us. So for example if um, the, the president of China or, or, or if um, Vladimir Putin from Russia were to come in and say this is how you know we're going to be doing things we would consider that to be inappropriate because they are not a member of our group as Americans, okay? So who am I and who are we? That is, um, what is this group of people of which I'm a member that ought to uh, govern itself, okay? The answer to that question is the definition of a nation. So before we go any further, let's make sure we know the difference between a country and a nation. So in the United States, um, country, uh, the, in, in the United States, the, in the country, the United States, um, exists the Cherokee Nation, a group of Native, Amer Native Americans who wishes to have ownership of their own government. Okay? In the United Kingdom, uh, we have um, the Scottish and we have the uh, Irish Republicans, and they wish to have their own, they wish to control their own government. Okay? The desire for self-government is what is key to the term nation. Um, the idea of nationalism is connected to the idea of a nation. Uh, we want to be governed as a group by ourselves. That's the nation, okay? But who counts as part of ourselves? In the USA, we recite the Pledge uh, of Allegiance that calls for one nation under God. Um, in the United States, we call baseball the national pastime. Okay? We share certain cultural and historic values, such as liberty and equality, and we have attachments to um, shared cultural symbols, such as the national anthem and the U.S. flag. But um, does this really represent a common pride and a belief in a common destiny? Are we truly one nation? Okay? Some might say yes, some might say no, uh, but this is a question worth pondering as we move forward through the rest of this chapter, okay, to kind of break down this nation within a country, okay, so make sure that we're, we're separating those, what's a country, that's the state, and then the nation, that's that group of people who wish to be self-governed, okay, so close to the state is going to be citizenship, close to that country, a citizenship is an individual's or a group's relation to the state, Okay? Citizens swear allegiance to the state, and the state in return is obligated to provide them rights. Uh, citizenship can convey uh, citizen obligations as well, um, and a more inclusive concept, uh, but very in, they, they're, they're going to vary in clarity and in power, um, and, but they give rise to patriotism, which is pride in one's state. Okay? So citizenship... Uh, often is given through birth, but often is also given through um, choice. We choose to be a citizen of, of, a, um, of a country, of a state. Okay, so why are we looking at all this? Okay, um, Because ethnicities and nations and countries often clash with one another, and that's what we really want to be examining here. Sometimes one nation dominates two different states, um, but may still be con that they may still be considered divided. Uh, for instance, there may be one Korean nation, even though there are two Korean states, North and South Korea, okay? But they're all Korean people, okay? Um, there are also multinational states, which are countries with more than one nation, 
okay? Uh, more than one politically defined identity group here. And so we talked about already about the United Kingdom has um, both Scotland and um, the um, um, Irish Republicans who wish for self-government. So they have these multiple nations within the United Kingdom. Okay? People in Great Britain typically think of Scotland and Wales and England as being separate nations united under one common state. Okay? In the developing world, uh, many state borders were drawn to reflect colonial power um, or administration rather than population uh, realities. And so as a result, we're going to see one of our case studies, Nigeria. Nigeria has over 250 separate ethno-linguistic groups. We're going to see some of the, uh, the, the troubles that have risen from this in the, in the state of Nigeria. Okay, the final distinction that we want to make before we move on between country and nation is important. Nation is not a legal distinction. Okay, rather it is a description of how people feel. So while some countries, such as Japan, uh, they claim to represent the will of one nation, very few countries have such a clean matchup between nation and country, especially when considering uh, modern migration patterns and immigration. Uh, even countries dominated by one group are not necessarily a perfect matchup. Egypt is predominantly Arab, okay, but it does, it does possess a sizable Coptic Christian minority. They make up of about 8 to 10 percent of, of Egyptians, okay. And so population-wise and politically, the Arabs are going to dominate Egyptian politics. However, the Copts, are, they have um, they've played an, an important role in uh, Egypt's economy and though, therefore they can't just be overlooked. Okay, so where do these identities come from? Many identities emerge alongside the modern state. Okay, because of increased commerce and in, in urbanization, uh, there's new forms of social interactions between people, and there's just new institutions. So state leaders often saw identity creation as a means to reinforce their power. They were going to say, we're going to say, we're going to try to um, form this nationalism, this patriotism, just to kind of bring the people together as one group, and they'll be easier to, um, to lead at that point. So ethnic and national identities, in turn, are going to transform the state as well. One more thing that we need to look at is um, the nation state. We need to examine that, which is a state encompassing one dominant nation that it claims to embody and represent. And so we often think of France as the prototype of the nation state, a country where, as a French nation defined by culture, by food, uh, by language, by customs, um, and one French state, France, okay, um, they are combined, all right? Uh, however, France has sought to ban the headscarf and the burqa in public, sp public spaces, um, creating tensions with their large Arab community. Okay? So in addition, Islamic fundamentalism is also on the rise, uh, particularly among France's second generation immigrants. So those are the ones who were born and raised in France. So even France, our prototype, is kind of suffering the, these, this identity problem where national and um, ethnic th don't, don't mesh up exactly. Okay? And so these, this is kind of the, the, the problems that we want to investigate in country to country because it's going to be more and more prevalent as we move on through this semester. So what happens when countries encounter this conflict between ethnic and national identity? Some countries seek to forge consensus between different, different ethnic and national identities. Uh, the United States does this. Okay? Other countries experience seemingly irreconcilable conflict uh, between groups like the Israelis and the Palestinians or the situation in Northern Ireland uh, where it's just it's always going to be a conflict. Um, still other times, uh, previously peaceful countries um, suddenly erupt into violence and we see this in Bosnia with the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bo Bosnian Muslims. Okay? Uh, questions about conflict and violence will be covered uh, in a lot more detail in Chapter 7 uh, but we, we can look at it a little bit here. So for now, let's consider a situation with eth in which ethnic and national identities are different um, and more important to at least some people um, than our national identities, okay? So it is important to remember that conflict that are seen as irreconcilable, 
okay? So there's no way to fix this conflict. Even those who have gone on for centuries can be de-escalated, okay? That they're, they don't have to get along all the time, but they can be peaceful to each other, okay? So while tensions remain high between Protestant and Catholic communities in Northern Ireland, um, the Good Friday Agreement has gone a long way towards building peace. So it can be done. We can reconcile some of those differences and at least live peacefully side by side. So as I mentioned earlier, Nigeria is going to be one of our case studies, and this is perfect for us to start looking at Nigeria right here, okay? We see all three sources of identity conflict in Nigeria. We're seeing extreme divisions, political exclusion, corruption, income inequality, uh, huge conflict over oil revenues. Nigeria has a long history of civil conflict, and the emergence of the terrorist group Boko Haram reflects this long-term pattern. Uh, Nigeria is a country with extreme ethno-linguistic diversity, and the major groups tend to view politics and economics as a zero-sum game. And what I mean by that is if one group wins, the other automatically loses. There's no compromise, okay? It's either win or lose. That's a zero-sum game. So widespread corruption and ethnic favoritism have led to considerable resentment against the central government. And Nigeria's extreme um, regional disparities in wealth have made been made even worse by the discovery of the oil in the Niger Delta. And so all of these things are going to clash together and we've got just like this um, powder keg happening right now about to explode in Nigeria. And like I said, we're going to get to that when we get to our case studies a little further down the road. But Nigeria is perfect to be looking at for these ethnic na national uh, identity, just everything coming to a head and, and clashing here. All right, my friends, so let's transition into comparing ideas and values, okay? Let's start with political attitudes and political ideologies. Uh, attitudes are the way people think about the political process as a whole. Uh, ideologies are what kinds of systems they would ideally prefer. Okay, so let's start with attitudes. There are four different political attitudes that we are going to want to know. And there are, they are radical, they are liberals, there are conservatives, and there are reactionaries. Um, some would add a fifth group as well, which would be the moderates, which would fall somewhere between the uh, conservatives and the liberals. Okay? Uh, radicals prefer large institutional change. Liberals prefer changes within institutions. Conservatives are going to be skeptical of change and therefore they, they like the status quo and the reactionaries are going to want to restore political, social, uh, economic institutions, whether real or imaginary. Uh, and so this is going to be kind of our form. We're going to go a little bit further into each of those right now. Okay, so on the far left of the political attitude scale are radicals. Uh, radicals and liberals. Radicals favor dramatic, often revolutionary change to the existing political, social, or economic order, uh, usually based in the belief that old institutions are broken and therefore they have to be replaced. So think about the Articles of Confederation were broken and they needed to be replaced by a constitution. That would be a radical idea going in. This evolved through the Constitutional Convention and we talked about all of that in, the, in, in Chapter 2 or in, in you know, the U.S. government. But um, we look at this going forward. Uh, that, that was a big radical change. We're going to just ditch this entire institution for this one. Okay? That would be a radical uh, ID, ideal ideology. Wow, that was hard to say, wasn't it? Liberals, on the other hand, uh, uh, they are going to favor gradual uh, evolutionary change, believing that existing institutions can create the positive change. So they think that, um, unlike the radicals who want to trash this and start fresh, they think that we can use the system that we're at to get where we need to be. So a lot of times the radicals and the, the um, liberals are going to have that same idea of where they want to go to. Uh, they're going to have a different ideas of how to get there. So one wants to take a train and one wants to walk maybe, okay? 
Um, so uh, an example of, of liberals might be the, the United States Democrat, uh, Democratic Party today. Okay? Um, they, they, they do see a need for change, but they think that change can be enacted through the system of government that we currently have. Now on the right, we're going to see the conservatives and the reactionaries. Uh, conservatives are skeptical of change, and they value continuity of institutions. Uh, they believe that traditions work, and then when traditions do work, they should be respected and fear change because the, if changing them might have unintended uh, impacts on the system itself. So one example would be the Germany's uh, Christian Democrats. Uh, they are. So, they want things to maintain the exact same way that they are. They, they fear change, okay? Um, and our reactionaries, they view the current order as fundamentally unacceptable, okay? They seek a return to an older system. Whether that system is conceptual, what they think it was like, or whether it was factually like that, okay? Um, an example of this would be the U.S. Tea Party. They think that things have gotten out of control. They want to take a step back in time to an, uh, when they think that things were a little bit more uh, right, in not right wing, but more correct. Um, and so um, each of these ideologies has, has its own place. And so uh, we want to make sure that we kind of are separating them. And we're going to uh, arrange them in one of two different ways, depending on your... Um, the way that you want to look at these um, these political attitudes. So our first way of looking at these political attitudes is going to be on a continuum, where we go from left to right, okay? And so we look at these views, we look at them on a continuum with the far left being radicals and the far right being reactionaries. Um, the way of thinking, this way of thinking um, about it makes it sense if the question is how are how open to change are people, okay? Liberals welcome change. They, they, are, they are all about change, okay? Uh, while radicals demand deep change. They want the whole thing to change. Liberals think change is good. Radicals are embracing change. They want as much change as they can get maybe, okay? Conservatives are gonna reject change. Um, and if the ch things have to change, they want things to change slowly so that the, the entire system isn't, isn't uprooted, okay? Uh, while reactionaries are gonna reject um, even past changes. They want things to go all the way back to the way things were when they think things were right, okay? So in the early 1900s, communists and socialists who sought left-wing social change, uh, so this would be more power for unions, restrictions, and, cap and capitalism, um, in the early 1900s, these communists and socialists who thought, sought this left-wing social change were all most active in supporting change, okay? As a result, the terms radical, uh, liberal came to be associated with leftist politics. Um, in other countries, however, uh, this isn't the case. In North Korea, for example, uh, a person advocating democracy, uh, free markets, they'd be called a radical because they'd want to change the system that they are currently in. Okay, a competing uh, viewpoint of the continuum would be a circle, okay, where reactionaries and radicals connect at the top and liberals and conservatives connect at the bottom. We have kind of this circle, okay? And the rationale for this is uh, radicals and reactionaries have some common traits. Um, both support violence in some cases in, in order to um, um, see existing regimes as being fundamentally illegitimate and changing them to what they need them to be. Um, on the other hand, liberals, um, conservatives, they accept the legitimacy of the existing regime. And they are going to be, therefore, um, opposed to, to violence in order to change those things. Liberals want a little change. Conservatives want to not accept change, but both do, don't uh, approve of violence in order to get there. Uh, radicals want a lot of change. Reactionaries want to get rid of the change, and both are okay with violence in order to get where they want to be. So let's shift views from political attitudes to political ideology. Political ideology, we start to look at different goals. And so the goal of liberalism 
is individual freedom. And for communism, that goal is economic equality. For social democracy, it is a balance between freedom and equality. For fascism, it's going to be an advancement of a superior group or race. And for anarchism, it's going to be the elimination of the state power altogether. Okay, so in a political ideology, it's the goal. What is the end goal? And that's what we're going to really be examining. So liberalism looks to limit the state's role in politics, society, uh, the economy. Uh, people as individuals pursue their own interests. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does, not, it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Okay, so he's saying basically the government should just stay out of our business, okay, unless it's going to hurt me, it's going to hurt you, it's going to actually hurt somebody. That's when the government needs to get involved, okay? So Thomas Jefferson is arguing to limit the state's role in politics and society and, the, and, and economics like we were talking about. That's liberalism. So liberalism is going to inspire liberal democracy, which is a system of political, social, economic liberties supported by competition, supported by participation, um, contestation, uh, and we're going to see this in the United Kingdom, we're going to see that here in the United States. So in contrast, communism rejects the idea that personal freedom will ensure prosperity for the majority. It believes that the state's role is to ensure wealth is shared, so there's no private property. Okay, A few inspired 20th century communist states include the Soviet Union, uh, China, Cuba. Um, and the idea here is that political liberty without economic equality is an illusion. Uh, as long as there is economic inequality, people will always be subject to coercion and manipulation. The only way to have true freedom there, then, is to free people from the constraints of a market economy. Okay, so we have liberalism and then we have com communism. They're pretty far apart. Um, social democracy is going to kind of plop down between them here. Social democracy attempts to balance freedom and equality. So here, there are strong markets and a role for private ownership, coupled with a strong state to regulate industry and to engage in social spending. Okay? Some modern European states are examples like Germany, uh, the Scandinavian states. Uh, social democrats seek a balance between individual freedom and economic equality. Uh, European states with market economies that also feature large welfare states and government services in support of economic equality come closest to achieving this ideal. Okay, so fascism is our next one. Fascists reject the ideas of freedom and equality altogether. Fascists believe in strict social hierarchies and inherent inequalities. Um, they are usually explicitly racist or ethnocentric. Okay? Uh, inspired fascist regimes, including Nazi Germany, um, the, the idea here is that any system based on individualism will be inherently weak. Okay? The nation is an organic whole, and individuals are best motivated um, by appeals to their common racial uh, consciousness. Okay? So far-right nationalism has seen a, res a resurgence in Europe uh, in recent years as a reaction to the continent's economic troubles, um, as well as to increasing immigration, including um, an influx of refugees from the Syrian conflict. Uh, so far-right parties are, being, are doing better in the polls and anti-immigrant protests and even violence against immigrant communities uh, has been increasing. And this would start to form that fascist viewpoint and start kind of inserting that back into Europe again. Finally, we've got anarchism, which is the view that the state is the complete threat to freedom and equality. Okay? Anarchists believe eliminating the state uh, and private property would achieve both freedom and equality. Uh, inspired, no state so far, okay? Uh, this is a system that has never been implemented. Um, although strains of it emerge in various protest movements and uh, partly among libertarians in the United States 
who see government itself as the primary threat to freedom and to equality, rather than as an enabler of freedom and equality, as other ideologies posit. Okay, friends, so we're almost done. Finally, the last thing we want to look at is political culture. Okay? The, these are the basic institutions and norms that define a society. So political culture influences the ideology that dominates a country's political regime. Okay? Different cultures will have different things. So traditional versus secular rational. Um, survival versus self-expression. Uh, physical security or social justice. Uh, in some countries, it is commonly accepted that the state plays no role in promoting a particular religion. While in others, uh, the state is expected to play a role uh, promoting religion, family values, deference to authority. Okay? Survival values emphasize economic and physical security and are associated with low levels of trust, uh, while self-expression values are focused on higher levels of tolerance, uh, demands for individual participation in politics. So what does a country believe? What are the, what, the, what does um, everybody in the United States value? What does everybody in China value? Okay, and so that will be our political culture. That's what we're looking at here. What is kind of um, permeates the entire society. So let's kind of sum everything up here again, okay? Ethnic identity and national identity are different, but they are powerful identities, okay? And we want to know the difference in how they come together and clash. Citizenship defines an individual's relationship with the state. Uh, most modern identities have developed alongside the modern state, okay? Ethnic or national differences may lead to conflict under certain conditions. In regard to attitudes, uh, radicals, liberals, conservatives, and reactionaries differ in their views toward established institutions. In regard to ideology, liberals, communists, social democrats, fascists, and anarchists are fundamentalists. They prioritize different policy goals. Okay? And finally, cultural values uh, shape a society's ideology and attitudes. And they are resistant, but they're not immune to change over time. Friends, that's the end of chapter three. A lot of, a lot of stuff to gnaw over here, okay? We're going to start to see why different countries are maybe not going to get along or why uh, different countries are kind of on the verge of maybe civil war or maybe a regime change. We're going to start to see this stuff in this chapter, okay? We're going to start seeing some of the problems with the world and maybe start to view uh, some of the... the uh, different parts of the world is maybe having a step up on us or maybe a step down on us based on your um, interpretation. And so make sure that you're kind of looking at this from a broad scope. Don't look at this from just the United States scope of this is the way we do things and this is how everything is right. So I'm going to kind of caution you this uh, throughout the rest of the course that don't think of all of these comparative government, uh, all these different cases as wrong because they do things differently than the way we do in the United States. Think of them differently. Think about what things we could maybe change in the United States to make things better. Think about why do they do things differently? Why do things not always work out for the United States, but they work out for some other countries? Or why are they maybe not working out for other countries? So these are the kind of things that we want to look at, and that's the stuff we're going to learn about when we're comparing these different governments here in uh, AP Kogo. Okay, so friends, I hope you have a great rest of your day. I am going to see you in class tomorrow. Us versus the test. See you soon.